start the class with a couple of mantras om bhu bhuva swaha tat savitra vare neyam bhargo deva sidhi mahi diyo yo nah prachodaya om sahna vavatu sahno gunaktu saviryam karvavahi tejasvi navadhi tamastu ma vidveshavahi Om Shanti 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 Om. Today is our Ramayan day. And we are on page number 175, chapter number 9. So, Shri Ram, Sita, Lakshman, they are in Panchvati, okay, in the Dandakwan. So let's see what happens there now. So they have been in exile for 10 years now, a bit over 10 years. The princes and Sita fell into a pleasant routine. They would wake up early each morning, go to the river, bathe and worship the rising sun. Ram and Sita would walk back hand in hand while Lakshman followed with the water pot. They wandered through the surrounding forests exploring them, enjoying them, or they bask in the sun all day long, living for the green moment. While deer laid their heads in Sita's lap and peacocks ate out of her hands. But one day, evil arrived in their lives, announcing itself comically. Shurpnaka, the Rakshasi, arrived in Panchvati. She was the spoiled sister of the emperor of evil, who lived on the distant island of Lanka, while his power spread from his throne like a great sickness through the world. Brought by fate, Shurpnaka on her hunt came to the grove in Panchvati. She scented humans in the ashram. She saw Ram from behind a tree and she was smitten. She looked at him. She turned and looked again. Her heart stood still at his unearthly beauty. She had never seen anyone like him. Shurpnaka wanted him for herself. She longed to run her fingers through the tangled mass of his hair. She yearned to stroke his face and clasp him tightly in her arms. She wondered who this was, handsome as Kamdev and as dark and blue. Shurpnaka was as ugly as Rakshasi has ever lived. She was old with the sin and years of devouring human flesh. She was bloated with the misshapen. Her voice was a harsh croak. Her hair was a dirty copper. Her eyes were tiny, cunning and cruel. She was faint and altogether hideous, but she was a mistress of Maya. She could change her form as she liked, though she could not change the evil in her soul. With just a thought, she turned herself into an Apsara-like beauty. Ravishing now, she came up to the princess. She ignored Lakshman and Sita, but flirting her lashes at him, swaying her hips and bending low so he could see her cleavage, she said seductively to Ram, Who are you, stranger? How have you come to this home of Rakshas, when obviously you are no Rakshas yourself? Ram looked into her eyes and knew what she was. He said, I am Dashrath's son Ram and I have come to live in the jungle for 14 years. These are my brother Lakshman and my wife Sita. And who are you? You seem to belong here. For you are a Rakshasi, I think. She blushed, she tittered. She said, I am no ordinary Rakshasi, Ram, but you are equal in pedigree. I am Shurpnaka. Ravan of Lanka, emperor of the world, is my brother. I live in Jansathan with my cousin Sukhar and Dushan. I have two more brothers who are in Lanka with Ravan. Kumbhkaran, who sleeps all year, and Vibhishan, who is so full of dharam that he is hardly a Rakshas. She smiled at him again, but all that is beside the point by my delectable prince. Fate brought me here. And the moment I saw you, I knew I must have you for my husband. You are the most handsome man I ever set eyes on. I have Maya and I can be as beautiful as you want. I am powerful, Ram. 
I will look after you. We are meant for each other. What can this pale Sita do for you? She at best is fit to be my morning meal. And she laughed uproariously at her joke. Ram said, Exquisite Shurpnatha, I am a married man and I love this pale Sita of mine. I don't think a great princess like you could bear to be my second wife. But my brother Lakshman is alone. He is younger and fairer than I am. He will make the perfect husband for you. Marry him and you will have him all to yourself. Shurpnakha turned to Lakshman. She saw he was handsome and strong too. She saw the muscles rippling on his arms and his chest. She switched her attentions to him. Caressing the younger prince's face, the Rakshasi said, Lakshman, we shall be happy together in the Dandak one. Let us be married. Charming Kshatriya, ah, you are so sweet. Let us be lovers. But Lakshman protested, I am only my brother's man. How will a princess like you be happy married to a mere servant? You should coax my brother a little more. Persuade him with your Maya Shakti. Better that you be his second wife than my only one. Woo him, lovely Shurpnaka. He will leave his pale princess for you. Shurpnaka saw the wisdom of what Lakshman said. She turned back to Ram. You spurn me for this limp hag of yours. I will eat her and then we can be happy together. With a roar, she rushed at Sita. Just in time, Ram sprang up and caught her. Quick as thinking, Lakshman drew his sword and cut off his ears and her nose. So dark blood spouted from her. Screaming in shock, a demoness again, Shurnaka fled into the forest. The brothers dissolved in mirth, but Sita trembled. Though she said nothing of it, she had a powerful premonition of evil as if already upon a distant throne. She sensed a malevolent emperor, a terrible being who turned his baleful gaze on them across vast spaces. Howling like a storm, Shurpnaka fell fled through the Dandak one. Birds and beasts scattered at her passage. Clutching her face, she went, roaring and shrieking, while blood gushed through her claws and splashed onto her thick feet. Through the dim jungle, she flew all the way to Janasthan, the city of Rakshas. She fell in a heap before her cousin Khar, demon king of the forest. When he saw what had happened to her, Khar roared louder than she did. Like some great serpent, he hissed, Who has done this to you? Who courts his death so fondly? Who has tied a noose around his own neck? I will drink his blood today and vultures and kites shall have his carcass to feed on. Tell me, Shurpnaka, which Dev or Dete has been such a fool? Shurpnaka sobbed inconsolably for a while. Servants washed her wounds and stopped the flow of blood with policies, policies of her herbs and leaves. Then her green eyes flashing, she said, Haven't you heard of the three strangers who live in Panchwati? Her face grew dreamy. Two are princes, handsome as if all the nobility of Kshatriya kind has been gathered just in them. Their limbs are strong and graceful. Their eyes are long as lotus petals. Their skins are bronzed as if they have lived in the open for many years. They wear Valkal and Jata like Rishis, but say they are sons of Dashrath of Ayodhya. O Khar, they are as enchanting as Gandharvas. They have wonderful weapons with them and seem to be great archers. They are called Ram and Lakshman. Her face grew dark. A spasm of hatred twisted her coarse features. Then there is Sita. Then there is she. She wears no bark, but fine silks and ornaments not of the earth. Diamonds and rubies, the like of which I have never seen. Because of her, the friendly princess named me. Help me, Khar. I want to drink their blood. Khar sent for 14 years of 14 of his fiercest Rakshas. He said to them, go to Panchwati and kill the three humans you find there. Shurpnaka wants to drink their blood. With the Shurpnaka showing them the way these Rakshas went to Ram's ashram, they came like rain clouds chased by the wind. 
When Ram saw them, he said softly to Lakshman, Watch Sita, it seems I have a battle to fight. Fitting an arrow to his bow, he stood waiting. Ram hailed the Rakshas. Why do you come armed with tridents and swords? We are Kshatriyas living here in peace. We wish no one any harm. The Rakshas leered. We have come to drink your blood and have your woman. Ram said, I have heard the rishis of the jungle have no peace because of you. Look, here is the bow of Varun raised against you. If you value your lives, lie. He stamped his foot as if he were chasing away some dogs. But those mountainous Rakshas roared like thunder. They rushed at the prince, casting their trishuls at him. He was so quick, none of them saw Ram's hands move. But they saw his arrows smash their tridents in shards. Next moment, they themselves lay dead, their bodies turning to ashes with the heat of the serpentine narachas with which he had shot them. For a bowman like Ram, this was a child's play. Shurpnakha stood open mouth at his archery. He smiled at her and playfully raised his bow again. With a shriek, she fled back to Khar. She said nothing to him at first, only sobbed incoherently. Her abominable cousin growled. Now what is it, Shurpnakha? I sent my men to avenge you. What else do you want? Shurpnakha managed. There is a new pool in Panchwati of your Rakshas blood. She shivered. I did not see Ram bend his bow or hear our men scream. One instant they rushed at him. The next they lay dead with his arrows buried in them to their feathers. Khar stared at her disbelievingly. Shurpnakha hissed. If Ravan or Kumbhkaran had been here, they would not let this pass. Are you afraid? You disgrace to your family. Khar, you are not fit to rule. Terrified of two humans, how Ravan would laugh if he heard this. Khar's roar shook the jungle. Don't taunt me, woman. Who says I'm afraid? I only waited for my rage to break its shores like the sea in a storm. Come, show me these human worms that I can send them to their ancestors in the sky. Shurknaka fawned on him, taking back what she had said to provoke him, praising his valor now. Khar summoned his brother Dushan, who was also his general. Let a thousand men march for each one this Ram killed. Fetch my chariot. We leave at once. Ravan's cousin Khar was a splendid Rakshas. His golden chariot drew up, laden with an array of deadly weapons. His army of demons, short and tall, handsome and ugly, some straight and some twisted, flowed around their king like a weird sea. They cried out in fell voices, stamped their feet, and waved their swords and spears, bows and tridents in the air. Khar of the Rakshas came forth from Janasthan with his formidable legion seating around him, a tide of darkness. But evil omens beset his going. A scarlet cloud appeared above them and a ghastly drizzle of blood fell on the demon force. The leading horse of the complement that drew Khar's chariot stumbled and broke its leg. When the anxious Rakshas looked into the sky, they saw the sun had a rim of darkness around it. A vulture flapped out of nowhere and perched on the flag above Khar's wooden castle. His men begin, began to whisper among themselves, but Khar stood up, tall and fierce in his chariot, and roared, I am not moved by these vagaries of nature. Only the weak pay them any heed. I am Khar of the Rakshas, master race of the world. My men are the greatest warriors on earth, and we will take death to the arrogant Kshatriyas. Indra and his devas dare not face us. What then of these human princes? Come, let me hear you roar when we march into battle. The emboldened Rakshas roared Khar's name. What indeed could two humans do against the fighting demons of Janasthan? The celestial rishis, the devas, Gandharavs, Siddhs, and Charans. All the immortal ones gathered in the sky above Panchvati to watch the battle between Ram and the Legion of Night. 
they said among themselves, Narayan has incarnated himself to rid the earth of Rakshas. There will be great bloodshed today. It is his first battle against evil on such a scale. Lakshman is with him. Ram is the sleeper on the waters. What can a band of jungle Rakshas do against him? You forget Khar is Pulaste's grandson. Pulaste was one of the original Saptarishi, the seven sages Brahma created in the beginning from his mind. Ram was not born to be killed by the likes of Khar. One day he will stand against Ravan of Lanka and then Dharam and Adharam will be tested against each other on earth. Khar drew near Panchvati. At the heart of his force, twelve ferocious demons ringed him around in their chariots. Enormous Mahakapal, Shuthulksha, Pramathi and Trishrish rode behind the legions and Dushan rode at its head. Like a horde of malefic planets came the Rakshas army as if to harry the sun and the moon. Ram saw the omens of the sky, the birds that flew in alarm before Khar. He saw the ring around the sun and the crimson cloud aloft. Varun's bow hummed impatiently in his hands. Ram cried to Lakshman, My right hand throbs. My arrows are smoking in their quiver. I feel as I did when Parshuram stood before me. But we must be careful, Lakshman, and today I must deprive you of the pleasure of battle. Take Sita up to the cave on the hillside. We must be on our guard against Shurknaka. Ram watched them leave. He strapped on his armor, light as the breeze. As he strung his bow, the power of that weapon surged through him. His astras, heart in their quiver, Ram stood like Shiva before he raised Daksha's yagya. Khar arrived in Panchvati. He halted his legion and with a horrible roar, the Rakshas attacked. Like rays of the sun, the demons' arrows, tridents and javelins covered the sky. They fell on Ram like lightning. The prince was struck but not, never wounded because his thin couch was magical. Then he replied, his arms were a blur, so even the devas and rishis above could not see them. Like molten thoughts, his arrows flared at the Rakshas and they fell in swarms, hardly knowing how they died. Ram strung his bow with the astras. Nalik, Narach and Vikrani blazed starfire at the shocked demons. They could not bear the fear those missiles threw and fled back to Khar. Some of them screaming, others whimpering like children. Astounded by Ram's valor, Khar rallied his people and advanced himself. Collecting their scattered courage, teeming around their king, the Rakshas charged Ram again. But quick as wishes, he drew a Gandharva Astra from his quiver and chanting its mantra, shot it at the demon army. The Rakshas saw a blinding fireball flare at them through the sky. The unearthly weapon broke, whistling among them. The Astra separated into a thousand arrows of fire and light. Ram's shafts filled the quarters. They turned into serpents with the heads of flames, fell on the howling demons, one shaft for each Rakshas, and not an arrow, but it took a life, consuming the fiend it struck, making ashes of him. Sudden desolation overtook Khar's army, then Dushan plunged out of the ranks like streak lightning in his black chariot. His fangs were Beard, married sorceries flashed around him to show he was a Rakshas with great powers of Maya. Dushan's demons, the occult phalanx of Khar's army, rushed at Ram. They cast their spells at him, flaming trees, rocks that exploded over his head, disgorging a thousand other sorceries and fire spitting serpents. Dushan barely saw Ram raise his bow or the four arrows that flew at him in the heart of an instant. They cut down his chariot horses. Another blinding shaft killed his charioteer. Three more pierced his armor, hurling agony through his blood. Roaring in shock, Dushan raised his mace and rushed at Ram. 
but so calmly that prince cut off the rakshas arms with the two crescent tipped arrows and slew him with another through his heart the rakshas who remained alive stood frozen around khar how could one man fight like this like two armies ram shot two more astras at khar's legions the monsters soldiers all perished like little mountains felled by indra's vajra of the thousand joints at last just khar and his three headed loathsome and completely fearless commander trisras were left alive amidst the smoking ruin of his army of 14000 speechless khar mourned his brother dushan trisras cried leave the kshatriya to me i will drink his blood today roaring from three mouths on three grotesque heads trisras flew at ram he too was a mayavi a sorcerer and he struck the prince with three arrows complex and quick as a sunbeams ram could not cut them down at the last moment he made them harmless with the mantra yet they strung him and he cried rakshas you have struck me thrice no ordinary archer could do this 14 arrows deep as time flew in formation from ram's bow they pierced the hearts of the rakshas horses and flew on up they cut down the banner on his chariot killed his charioteer and finally they crashed into trisras chest so his six eyes bulged round he rose screeching from the wreckage of his rat and ram cut his heads from his swollen body with three more light like shafts the demon's blood flowed across panchvati in three black rills while his heads rolled down the hillside roaring louder than ever to keep his own courage up khar king of the jungle came to fight he was even more of an archer than trisras and a fear battle broke out the devas above side when from his whirlwind chariot khar split varun's bow in ram's hand ram seized up the brahmadat and its jewels radiated shafts of fear into the rakshas heart now ram's arrows sang as they flamed at the demon king but khar was a worthy adversary it was true that indra himself would have hesitated to fight him in the heat of battle crimson eyed ram cried serpent of the jungle all your sins have borne fruit today prepare to die but khar rolled back you crow because you killed a handful of common soldiers but i am a khar your death and this mace in my hand will send you to yam bid farewell to your life princeling i mean to drink your blood before the sun sets only then will i sleep in peace tonight his dark mace raised aloft he flew at ram but ram shattered that dire weapon with a single shaft he cried to the bewildered rakshas sleep you will khar upon the earth as you would in the arms of a woman you have long desired and the rishis of the dandak one will roam the jungle in freedom again with maya khar grew tall as a hill he pulled up a shall tree by its roots and flung it at ram but the prince dodged it nimbly and struck the rakshas with 20 sizzling arrows so he screamed and tore them out of his flesh like poison thorns ram stepped back but the demon ran at him again with his bare hands he strung the brahmadatt with an andrastra invoking the king of the devas he shot khar through his chest with that final weapon one moment the rakshas rushed at ram with his claws outstretched to seize his throat the next he screamed as the astra struck him and his flesh fell away from his skeleton in anxiety to escape the intolerable pain of that missile his heart exploded then his giant head and nothing was left of khar but patches of blood skin and a heap of bones on the ground this triumph of the avatar was beyond the wildest hopes of the devas who rained down shimmering petals like fireflies on ram the sky was full of gandharva's songs dancing apsaras cast their shadows on saffron clouds above the sunset ram looked around him and saw the ground strewn with the corpses of the rakshas 
and their elephants and horses as plentifully as Yagishala is with the dharab grass. He sighed and suddenly exhausted, sat down among the dead. Their faces shining, Lakshman and Sita emerged from the cave. Sita ran to Ram and flung her arms around him. Lakshman fetched water from the river and with equal love his brother and his wife bathed his wounds. Again and again Sita would embrace her husband. Her eyes were full of tears, of sorrow to see his injuries and of excitement at his dazzling victory. Any question? So after each chapter, we'll definitely, it was a long chapter, so uh, we'll stop and then if there's any question or a comment, uh, we'll take that before we start the next one. Okay. But you can see that uh, how fierce uh, that fight was. First, just with the 14 people, 14 Rakshas, then 14,000 Rakshas. And Kar and Dushan and all those is uh, uh, the great leaders also, the others, full of Maya. So no wonder God had to incarnate uh, to get rid of the devils. Okay. So if you don't have any question, you can see what happens after this. Harshji, Namaste, Manju, Manju. <laughs> makes me laugh. Supraka tried all those things. So it's so funny the way they have written cleavage and all that. She bends down. Oh my God. Yeah. Even in those days. Yeah. Oh. See, nature doesn't Such change. A, yeah. Whether it's a, a, any, a, any uh, uh, yoga. We will find uh, yeah. uh, these kind of, even now, I mean, we can read from here uh, that if yeah. we act like that, if we wear clothes like that, we are, uh, we are behaving like uh, rakshas. But on the other hand, if we cover ourselves beautifully, we are, uh, we are emulating Sita. Good idea. Did you ever see Sita like that? Yeah. So it's up to us. Choice is ours. So do we want to have Shurpnaka as our ideal or Sita as our ideal? Mm -hmm. The way she, Sita talked, the way she behaved, her relation, right. her respect, her love for the husband. Mm -hmm. And Shurpnaka, <laughs> we don't want to be like that, right? So right. that's why... But there are... are lot of women, uh, young girls, who are always uh, showing off their cleavage. It's uh, in style over here. Every yeah, other woman in style of the, in style of the Rakshas. Okay. I have, I have a question, Hash. Sure. Bhagwan says that good and bad are my two. He said that I have no Rakshas in Gita. And I have no Rakshas in Gita. So, this is the same thing that we have done. Okay, you can't do it. 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 Because this is also God's uh, law. Freedom. You can't do it. 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 What is part of God? Uh -huh. It's the purest of the pure. Uh -huh. It's the layer of the Maya which becomes dark. So Maya is the Bhagwan ki apni hai na? Apni hai, but it's a lower nature. Lower nature. God, God said, there's a Prakriti is my lower nature. Higher uh -huh. than Prakriti is the Purush. And higher uh -huh. than that is Purushottam. And there's nothing higher than me. So it's up to us. Do we want to just get attached to the lower nature or do we want to reach to the higher? If we get attached to the lower nature, then definitely we will have the ups and downs. But if we just reach towards the highest, then there is a calmness. Freedom is there. This is God's rule. This is the law. Okay. So he has given us the freedom. Freedom to play as we wish, but consequences are there. 
We cannot say that I'm going to just act like a Rakshas and the fruit should be like a Devta. No, it won't be. The fruit will be what we deserve. Okay? Don't we always say that we get what we deserve, not what we desire. What we deserve. Uh, yes, Jyoti. Shilpa has a question. Shilpa. Oh, Shilpa has a question. Okay, Shilpa. Uh, what is a narachas? That the is serpent. like a name of name of one of the um, um, arrows. You remember he received many different kind of weapons from different rishis, from Agastya Muni also, from Vishwamitra also, right? From all those Munis, they kept giving different weapons, those name of the different weapons. Oh, okay. And okay. another question. When Ram uh, knew that uh, Surpakna was a Rakshashi, right? Yeah. And she asked uh, to marry Ram, but then Ram said, Lakshman, my brother, who's single, why would he <laughs> they suggest? Were teasing. They oh, were okay. teasing each other. See, just like a brothers, they'll just play with each other. That's okay. what it was. Okay. okay, he knew Lakshman is not going to do that. It's like a play between the brothers. I mean... From these incidents, we can see that uh, they, they acted like humans. Humans who were very much in control of their situation and control of their mind. Okay. They played okay. each other. You can even when Sita and Ram, they uh, held their hands and walked together lovingly. That's it. Uh, it's okay to do that. That's a human. Okay. Oh, no. Show the love to the other. Okay. So thank so you. He's not, he's not suggesting, he's only teasing. Okay. Anybody else? I think Poonam, Poonam, did you have a question? I just thought that when we talk about uh, Mahabharat and then uh, Dropti laughed at Karan and the whole story started, same here. Once Rupnaka's nose is cut off, they both laughed while she's running away. I don't know what this story is about laughing. <laughs> I think that's where the story is going to start anyway. No, they no, I, I think they cut, her, cut her nose and ear, and then they laughed. And so they, no, they did not they laughed at that. No, no, no. I don't think they were laughing. We don't know. It says they laughed. So Rupnaka's laughter was different. We don't know. <laughs> laughter is laughter. <laughs> Yeah, no, but laughter this is laughter think... for the one who has been who has been embarrassed for that person. Laughter is laughter. I don't know how they were laughing. <laughs> yeah, okay. but I don't think it's a, even if they wouldn't have laughed, Shrupnaka was going to go back to his cousins and the brothers afterwards because she just wanted Ram so badly. She thought that she can have anybody, you know. And then when she got insulted, so cutting a nose and the ears that means she got really badly insulted. Okay, so so now let's uh, yeah we do have time to read the next one also. Again, it's a long chapter, but let's try to finish it. So in Lanka, there was a Rakshas called a Kampan, who was part of Khar's army. So he was part of that fourteen thousand uh, soldiers. He, 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 he hid himself out of sight and escaped Ram's arrows. A Kampan headed straight for Lanka in his chariot that flew through the air. He arrived at the massive palace gates of the Sovereign of Evil. Within the doors of that magnificent palace, in a splendid sabha at its side, was a black crystal throne encrusted with priceless jewels that were tribute paid by royal vessels throughout the three worlds. Upon this throne sat the master of darkness. In a weird cone upon his neck were ten heads of varying features of sizes, all of them savage. Ravan was a monster, the most sinister and powerful Rakshas. Nothing about him was ordinary. All his ten heads thought for him. So these are ten heads um, in Valmiki's Ramayan, he doesn't uh, write like that, that there was physical ten heads. Somehow this translator uh, has written it like this. 
So he had only one head, but very powerful person. And his intelligence and knowledge were unrivaled in heaven or earth. He was the grandson of Brahma's son, Pulaste Muni, thus the creator's own great grandson, and he had Shiva's blessings. Ravan was thousands of years old, but he was a Tapaswin, so he did not look even a small part of his true age. He kept women of every race, the most beautiful and seductive women from all the realms. He was an expert of the arcane tantra vidya, and they helplessly gave him their youth in his bed. Often the virgin who spent just a week with him emerged from his harem, looking 10 years older than what when she had been brought to the Rakshas. He was uh, insatiable and his uh, lovemaking was a diabolic ritual. He drained a woman of her precious years of her very destiny. Ravan was an awesome monarch. His instinct ranged from uh, over his domains as the sun does over the earth. Within his ten satanic heads, he sensed all that happened throughout his uh, empire. What he did not sense, where goodness and dharam raised their hated visage, his servants to whom his interested dominion in his dreaded name reported to him. And at one once Ravan dispatched some venal or murderous agent to subvert or suppress it without mercy. He was a complex kingdom and he ruled over it by his own lights his own dark wisdom. Today his side throbbed and three of his heads ached relentlessly since morning. The demon knew bad news was on its way, even before Akampan burst into his presence and fell sobbing at his feet. Ravan sighed like a ravine full of the wind. He spoke from the mouth on his central face, the one with the coppery eyes. He said sonorously, Tell me, Akampan, what news of my cousins and my sister? The Rakshas from Janasthan stood trembling that he who brought news as bad as his could meet a swift death. Ravan said again, have no fear, Akampan. You know you can tell me anything. Cajoling, he sounded almost gentle. Akampan started, uh, stared down at his feet. He drew a breath and said in a whisper, my lord, all the Rakshas in Janasthan are dead. Har is dead and Dushan. Trisras is a slain. Deep in all Ravan's eyes, there was a flicker as if some unimaginable serpent had stirred from its slumber in his heart. The smile did not leave his frontal face, though the others grew grim. In the same cajoling tone, still casually, he asked Akampan, who did this thing? Akampan thought Ravan had taken the news very well. He said, I escaped in my chariot, Lord. Ravan's eyes blazed briefly. Who did it? A man, Lord. But I heard of no army that came to Janasthan. Akampan said nothing. He did not know where to look. Ravan said quietly, reasonably, whoever they are, don't they realize there is no escape for them? Not in Devlok, because Indra fears me. Not with Kuber, Varun or Agni, shall they find sanctuary, bold though they must surely be and gifted to have raised Khar's army. I will find them a Kampan and I will bring them here to Lanka. Not even a Kampan liked to think what his master did with those he brought to the dungeons of Lanka. A Kampan said softly, not them, Lord, him. What do you mean, whispered Ravan, all his ten heads swiveling round to stare at his demon. Those heads were like an inverted bunch of macabre fruit. The one at the top, very top, was the smallest and the most vicious. It was entirely puerile and malignant. A compan's voice rattled in his throat at the awful regard. Looking anywhere but at Ravan, he breathed. One can kill them, one man killed them all. A roar began on the littlest, purely demonical face. Then the ten heads rolled together, last of all the central one around with the others budded. The palace shook. The king's guards came running to his door, though none dared enter. 
Akampan thought his end had come. The ten faces now spoke together as they did when the Rakshas was out of control. In ten voices, Ravan cried, You say one human killed Khar, Dushan, Trisris, and all the army at Janasthan? Are you sure you haven't been drinking cane liquor all morning, Akampan? Akampan swallowed. He shivered at the change in his emperor. But he managed to say again, one man, lord of the worlds, just one man with his bow and arrows. Ravan stared from all his eyes, the heads cocked at many quizzical angles. He stared in disbelief at Akampan, who raised his hands to shield himself from the gaze. He cried, I beg you, listen to me, lord. The devilish heads grew attentive. There was once a king called Dashrath. He belonged to the race of Surya, to the royal house of Ikshvaku. He had a son called Ram, who is as blue as a wild lotus. Ram came to the Dandakwan. His shoulders are wide as a bison's and he is as strong as a lion. He is a master of Astras and he killed the Rakshas of Janasthan. Perhaps Indra sent a host to help him. Let us have the truth, Rakshas. I thought of Indra when I saw Ram's archery. But no, Inder did not come to help Ram. His astras were a thousand arrows each, and each shaft turned into a five-headed, fire-mouthed serpent. Janasthan is a desolation. Those of us who survived, the handful who fled, have no sleep anymore, for Ram's face haunts our dreams. I believe he has a brother called Lakshman, who is his equal, but he took no part in the battle. Ravan sighed like the north wind on the mountain top. His lips curled, fangs flashed at the corners of his mouth. He rose and crossed to his bay window, which looked out over the turquoise sea. He said softly, I will go to Janasthan myself to kill these brothers. Oh no, before you do anything in haste, listen to what I have heard about this Ram. He can hold up a river with his arrows. They say if he wants, he can extinguish the sun and the stars with his astras. He can raise the earth out of the sea if it is submerged or plunged it into the deeps of breaking the bounds of the world. All the rishis say that he is Vishnu come as a man. He shone like a god when he stood facing our army. army. He was a blue sun and he killed 14,000 Rakshas as they were small children before him. A company had been thinking feverishly on his way to Lanka to save his skin as the bearer of the news he brought. Ravan was about to speak, but he saw the light of an idea in his rakshas eyes. Finish what you are saying, a company. It would be foolish, my lord, to engage Ram in a duel, for you could not be certain of the outcome. But there is another way, he paused and saw he had his master's interest. Ram has a wife called Sita, who followed him into the forest. She is exquisite. He loves her more than his own life. And she, him, they are like pran to each other. Ravan's topmost head hissed. So what? What are you trying to say? Sure of himself now, a company continued at his ease. She is the most beautiful woman in the world, Ravan. The Apsaras of Devlok cannot compare with her. Her face is perfect. Her body is a vision. Say what you have to quickly, fool, said the monster of Lanka. A company blurted. If you were to abduct Sita and bring her here secretly, Ram would die pining for her. The nine heads mulled over this, whispering sibilantly among themselves. Then in surreal chorus, they grinned horribly and all together. They bobbed up and down, endorsing a company's idea, delighted with it. Ravan's main face smiled, showing four rows of fangs. I like your plan. Tomorrow at sunrise, I will fly to the Dandak one myself to bring Sita back to Lanka. A company bowed deeply and left the presence without turning his back on his emperor. Ravan stood at his window for a long time staring across sullen green waves. Then he turned back to his duties and pleasures of the day and to his endless study. The Rakshas was a profound scholar. 
He retired early that night and he ordered no woman to come to him. He soon fell asleep, the eyes in all his heads shut fast. The next morning before the sun rose, Ravan sat in the strangest chariot. This rath was made of gold, alloyed with a starry metal, and four horned mules were yoked to it. They were green creatures of sorcery and flew through the sky quick as thoughts at their master's command. When Ravan was ready, his chariot rose into the air. It hovered there, swathed in eerie luster as the sun crept up behind the palace. The demon raised a hand to wave to his rakshas below. Next moment, the chariot vanished from sight. Ravan flew across the sea of Bharat Varsha. He flashed across the plateau of the southern peninsula, over field and forest, mountain and river. He slowed his flying mules over a jungle below him. That was his destination. He peered down to find the hermitage for which he was bound. Quite soon, he spotted Mariches Ashram. Its wood fires smoke curled into the sky with a command that was just a potent thought. Ravan flew down smoothly as a bird and alighted in the glade where the Rakshas Marij, now turned a Rishi, sat in Dhyan. It was the same Marij whom Ram had once doused in the sea with the Manavastra. Marij was Ravan's uncle. He gave a cry of welcome when he saw who had come to visit him. Quickly he laid out a Darbasan for the emperor and set a bowl of food before him. Marich was older than he and Ravan paid proper, if somewhat hollow, obeisance to him before he settled into the grass throne. Marich blessed him and said, what a pleasant surprise, Matthew. Something important must bring you to my ashram. Tell me what has happened. Ravan looked away from Marich. He gazed at his humble hut. He gazed at the tree under which it was built on which the wild flower garlands of worship hung. He took his time to begin and then said, Uncle, did you know that all my Rakshas in Janasthan have been killed? Kharadushan and all the rest, the entire army has been raised. He drew a talon eloquently across his throat in a day. Marichi's eyes grew round. How? When Khar led the army, how? Studying his dark, brutal hands, Ravan said quietly, one man killed them all. He paused, then rolling the words on his tongue as if to see if they would conjure any magic, he said slowly, Akshatriya Aram. Marich drew a sharp breath, his hair stood on end, he held up his hands and cried, don't say that name. Ignoring him, Ravan continued, obviously the human is powerful, such power is a threat to me. He took up a blade of dharab grass and began to pick his fans. This Ram must be killed, but we think he is too dangerous to face in battle. Marij, who had experienced Ram, nodded his head several times in assent. Ravan continued, we think his wife should be taken in secret to Lanka without Ram knowing where she has gone. We know noble hearts like this. He will pine for her and die, or he will think her dead and kill himself to join her in the next world. I need your help, Marij. But Marij gave a moan. To his surprise, Ravan saw the old Raksha's hands shook and his face was filmed in a sweat of fear. Struggling to compose himself, Marij cried, Whoever set you on this course is your enemy and wants to see you dead. Is one of your advisors trying to kill you? You would be mad even to think of it. The same Ram once shot me a thousand yojans into the sea and you find no one else to abduct but Ram's wife. Marich breathed heavily. His eyes bulged in anxiety. Ravan, you are the lord of all the Rakshas and someone is envious of you. He is trying to have you killed. Ram will finish you if you go near him. He is like a sleeping lion. Only a fool will thrust his head into the lion's jaws and then awaken him. You are my nephew, I am your well-wisher, and I want nothing from you. Return to Lanka to your women. Forget you ever heard of name Sita. Ravan, don't invite your death to you. Ravan listened calmly. He was unmoved by the descriptions of Ram's prowess, unmoved even by Marich's obvious fear, but he respected Marich almost as a guru and he had never heard him speak of anyone else as he did of Ram. 
Since there were such conflicting opinions about abducting Sita, he decided to let caution prevail. Ravan said, very well, uncle. If you feel so strongly, I will not take Sita, though it rankles that a mere man treats us as this Ram has, and I have no fitting response for him. But no matter, there is no hurry. I am sure the chance will present itself one day, and I will crush this prince like an insect under my nail. All his heads glowed at the thought. Ravan flew back to Lanka in his mule chariot. So this is the end of this chapter. So now in the next chapter, we'll see next week how Shurpnaka goes to his brother. And she cries over there and she excites him so that he goes and kidnaps Sita with the help of Marich. So any question, comment? before we have a chanting. Or she knew she was going to sing today. Okay, I like good, good. But if anybody has a question, we can take the question first before the singing. We still have six minutes. Nobody. Nobody? Nobody. Oh. I think Poonam wants to say something. Yeah. Yes, Poonam. Uh, oh. You said in the Hindi translation, there was no mention of 10 heads. But yeah. here he keeps on talking about those 10 heads again and he gives the description and all that. This is only done here? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that is his imagination. Mm. So even in our own head also, sometimes part of the head says something, yeah. the part of the head says something else, right? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes we want to do it, but then we don't want to do it. We are happy, we are sad also, we are curious also, we are calm also. So because he his head was so big, in a way, he was so arrogant also. You can say any, you can read any way you want to. But these 10 physical 10 heads, there's no description of that. Uh, in, in this one, but then Tulsi Das does it when he does the uh, the other one, the other Ramayan. We have 10 heads in that then. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 yeah, yeah. Some, some, uh, but we are trying to follow the Valmiki's Ramayan. Yeah. So Valmiki Ramayan, uh, they do say, uh, they use the word thus uh, uh, grieve, but but thus grieve was just a name for Ravan, yeah. not a physical ten heads. Mm -hmm. Okay, because when so they burn it on the day the, on the Sarah, they are burning uh, the, the a symbolic. Ravan, and they all put like ten heads. So ever yeah. since we were little, we always saw ten That's heads. like a symbolically yeah. saying that yeah. he was he was a, 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 a scholar. Yeah, he was definitely a tapasvi also. He was powerful also, and as we saw that he is a grandson of the Rishi. That yeah, is, Rishi was born from Brahma. Brahma, yeah, the direct descendant of Brahma. So he had all those powers, but in spite of having all that, he just became so arrogant. Yeah, and then this had to happen this way. Mm -hmm. Actually, Ravad is the one who put all the bath in the like a poetry style. Ravan is the one who did it. And uh, that's the reason and then the Sivji gave him a name of Ravan. The Ravad Thana Usko Usne Bedon Kobi Apne Hasse Wokia Usko Lika poetry room, Sitar Kisat Mus Nika. That's the reason subject poetry may and a bed. So he, was, he was wise, he was a scholar but not wise. Then if you kidnap somebody's wife. Well he was a hankar. He was a hankar. Yeah, you are very extremely arrogant. Let me just go through the Hindi and, and uh, titles also so that you will know exactly where this English translation is coming from. Shri Ram ke ashram mein shurup nakha ka aana, unka pariche chaanna aur apna pariche de kar, unse apne ko bharya ke roop mein grahan karne ke liye anurodh karna. So it's not that she just did not tell them that who she is. So there was a proper uh, introduction from both sides. Shri Ram ke taal dene par shurup nakha ka lakshman se 
पर्यन वाच याचना करना फिर उनके भी टालने पर उस पर सीता पर आक्रमण और लक्ष्मण का उसके नाक कान काट लेना शूर्पनखा के मुख से उसकी दुर्दशा का वृतांत सुनकर क्रोध में भरे हुए खार का श्री राम आदि के वध के लिए चौदह राक्षसों को भेजी सो शी नेवर टोल्ड हर कजन दैट आम द वन हु वेंट देर आम द वन हु ट्राई टू अटैक सीता शी ओनली सेट दैट दे अटैक मी श्री राम द्वारा खर के भेजे हुए चौदह राक्षसों का वध so first he sent 14 then shurpnakha ka ghar ke paas aakar un rakshon ke vadh ka samachar batana aur ram ka bhay dikha kar use yuddh ke liye utejit karna 14000 rakshson ki sena ke sath khar dushan ka jan sthan se panchvati ki or prasthan so jan sthan is the name of that place okay and that was occupied by the rakshas भयंकर उत्पातों को देखकर भी खर का उनकी परवाह नहीं करना तथा तो राक्षस सेना का श्री राम के आश्रम के समीप पहुंचना सो भयंकर उत्पात मीन्स ऑल दो बैड ओमस विच वर कमिंग फ्रॉम द नेचर बट स्टिल जस्ट डिस श्री राम का तात्कालीन कालिक शकुन का शकुनो द्वारा राक्षसों के विनाश और अपनी विजय की संभावना करके सीता सहित लक्ष्मण को पर्वत की गुफा में भेजना और युद्ध के लिए उद्यत होना राक्षसों का श्री राम पर आक्रमण और श्री रामचंद्र जी के द्वारा राक्षसों का संहार श्री राम के द्वारा दूषण सहित चौदह सहस्र राक्षसों का वध त्रिशरा का वध हर के साथ श्री राम का घोर युद्ध so this is a pretty prominent part of this ramayana this khar and dushan and, and, and the war between ram shri ram ka khar ko phutkarna tatha khar ka bhi unhe kathor uttar dekar unke upar gada ka prahar karna aur shri ram dwara us gada ka khandan shri ram ke vyang karne par khar ka unhe phutkar kar unke upar sal vriksh ka prahar karna shri ram ka us vriksh ko kaat kar ek tejasvi vaan se khar ko maar girana तथा देवताओं और महर्षियों द्वारा श्री राम की प्रशंसा रावण का अकंपन की सलाह से सीता का अपहरण करने के लिए जाना और मरीज के कहने से लंका को लौटाना दिस पार्ट इज राइट दैट रावण गोज टू मरीज फर्स्ट एंड मरीज से रावण कम्स बैक because sometimes we don't see this part when it's played in the uh, those videos which we watch sometimes okay but 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 he did listen to marich but then shurpnakha is going to go and then uh, she is going to cry at his shoulders ash ji yes uh, everywhere they have used this 14 years and 14 army and 14 is there any significance of this number 14 for any reason I have never read the significance. No. No. Yeah. So there must be. I mean, maybe it was a popular number. What do you mean? Popular number, and <laughs> it was supposed to be like that. Yeah. But now we'll see. See next week, Shurp Nakha ka Lanka me Ravan ke pas jana. So sometimes she just stayed there, and then after that she said, "Okay, all right. Now I got to. I'm ready to go to my brother and excite him." So. I mean, look at look at the. um the big part played by women in the entire ramayan mantra kya kai shurpnakha sita mandodri they are all very powerful women right women do have powers that's why i always tell you the people who come to me for marriage before i do the marriage i always counsel them i tell them that women we women are very powerful we can create a heaven or a hell it's up to us so if you want to create a heaven use this power positively all right let's uh, just have a uh, raj i have one quick question sure raj same author 
Ramesh Menon, we've had issues before about the authenticity. Like this time he's talking so much about the 10 physical heads. I know. And before he did that uh, with them, I think bringing some meat or killed. Uh, yeah, the translation of that, yeah, he said that uh, they sacrificed uh, the meat uh, for their, uh, uh, when they built the kutia and before yeah. entering of the kutia, they did that. Yeah, that's right. That was wrong too. So that's why I always uh, go back to this Valmiki's Ramayan and tell you the part, most of the part he's okay. But some places, yes, he has. So once we are done completely, then maybe I'll send him a, a little letter. Or yeah, because I'm curious how he's yeah. getting his information. Yeah, let's, Exactly. Let's go through the whole book and then maybe we'll, we'll I'm keeping notes of that. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. I think uh, today uh, Niru wants to sing. So Niru and anybody else who wants to sing in the evening, we do have a, a Janamashtami program eight to nine. So please uh, let many know so that he can just uh, have the proper sequence and we'll just uh, sing a Christian bhajans tonight. Okay. But right now, Niru, please. Namaskar, Harshi. Namaskar, Niru. Yeah. I'm not a singer, so I'm just trying. So I it's just okay. love... You are a Bhagat. Yeah. Bhagat, that's all we... We want to listen from a Bhagat's uh, heart. Yeah. Shri Krishna Govind Hare Murari he not Narayan Vasudeva Shri Krishna Govind Hare Murari He not Narayan Vasudeva Itmat Swami Sakha Hamare Itmat Swami Sakha Hamare He Nath Narayan Vasudeva Shri Krishna Govind Hare Murari He Nath Narayan Vasudeva Thakur Hamare Prano Se Pyaare Thakur hamare prano se pyare Tum ho hamare hum hai tumhare He Nath Narayan Vasudeva Shri Krishna Govind Hare Murari He Nath Narayan Vasudeva Gaya Charaya Makan Churaya Gaya Charaya Makan Churaya Dino ki naya ke Tum ho ke vaya He Nath Narayan Vasudeva Shri Krishna Govind Hare Murari He Nath Narayan Vasudeva Govind Mero Hai Gopal Mero Hai Govind Mero Hai Gopal Mero Hai Shri Panke Pehari Nandalal Mero Hai Shri Panke Pehari Nandalal Mero Hai Shri Krishna Govind Hare Murari He Nath Narayan Vasudeva Shri Krishna Govind Hare Murari He Nath Narayan Vasudeva 
अग्नि पवन और सातो समंद तुम से है धरती और तुम से अंबर हे नाथ नारायण वासुदेव श्री कृष्ण गोविंद हरे मुरारी हे नाथ नारायण वासुदेव गोविंद बोलो हरि को पाल बोलो गोविंद बोलो हरि को पाल बोलो गोविंद बोलो हरि को पाल बोलो राधा रमन हरि गोविंद बो गोविंद बोलो हरि को पाल बोलो राधा रमन हरि गोविंद बोलो हे नाथ नारायण वासुदेवा श्री कृष्ण गोविंद हरे मुरारी हे नाथ नारायण वासुदेवा श्री कृष्ण गोविंद हरे मुरारी हे नाथ नारायण वासुदेवा जय श्री कृष्ण thank you neeru beautiful beautiful thank All you all right so uh, jyoti you can unmute everyone